Greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV radio and podcast with Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre. I am Steve Dace, and we're brought to you by our friends over at Jace Medical. Right now, they've got a giveaway going on. through Now through August the 31st, your opportunity to win a free Jace case every year for the rest of your life. That's right, a free Jace case every year for the rest of your life right now. No purchase necessary when you go to jace.com slash dace. Easy to remember. It rhymes. J-A-S-E. For jace.com slash dace, that's jace.com slash dace. And while you're there, make sure you've got your jace case. Backup of some of the most important antibiotics we've ever discovered as a species. You can also expand it now. They've got an increasing repertoire of uh, and menu of medications now. So a lot of your own medications uh, can get backups too, just in case they're next put on the you can't have it just when you need it list. And yes, that includes ivermectin as well. And if you use the promo code DACE at checkout, you'll get a discount. Jace.com, J-A-S-E, Jace.com slash DACE, promo code DACE for the discount jace.com promo code dace little programming note tomorrow we are not going to be here we have the day off um trying to take as much time this summer as we can with the time we have so that we're here as often as we can during the election um so uh, we will have a regular show though for you tomorrow um earlier this year we recorded a long form interview with john cooper the lead singer of skillet And I think you're going to be absolutely fascinated by that conversation. His experiences on the road, touring, homeschooling, Christian homeschooling kids on the road while touring with heavy metal acts. And what is that like? That's rock and roll, right? That is. That is, yes. Uh, And his own faith journey, um, the state of masculinity in America and more. I really think you're going to enjoy this one. And I know you guys have enjoyed all the ones we've uh, kind of presented to you so far this year. So that is coming up on tomorrow show coming up on today's show uh, we will get into a full hour of theology thursday we continue our conversation on romans that's coming up next hour at the bottom of this hour we're going to talk to a pastor who says hey i'm one of those abolitionist crazy people that even the pro-life movement thinks they can't even with and I think we absolutely need to be voting for Trump in this election he's going to make that case coming up at the bottom of this hour but before we get there Let's get to Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by the economy, stupid. Donald Trump rallied in Asheville, North Carolina yesterday and unveiled portions of his economic vision should he be elected in November. I'm announcing today that under my leadership, the United States will commit to the ambitious goal of slashing energy and electricity prices by half, at least half. We intend to slash prices by half within 12 months at a maximum 18 months. And if it doesn't work out, you'll say, oh, well, I voted for him. I still got him down a lot. Kamalians, your thoughts. We're not going, we're not going back. We're not going, we're not going back. Just like a tree that's planted by the favorite curse word <laughs> i can't say it it starts with an m and it ends with a uh. control of our own bodies we're not going back just like a tree that's planted by the water Meanwhile, in Michigan, J.D. Vance says he wants to remember the forgotten Americans. I love Byron Center. I've been here just about a couple hours, but Byron Center has been cast aside. And a lot of places in this country have been cast aside by America's ruling class in Washington, D.C. Now, politicians come into places like Michigan, they say nice things, but they crush our industries, they offshore our jobs, and they undercut American wages with illegal labor. You, my friends, have been betrayed. And the people who have been doing the betraying have gotten rich off of this country's decline. And it's time to call them out, and it's time to kick them out of office. The first Emerson College poll post-Biden dropout has been released. Emerson has been one of the best, if not the best, pollster in recent cycles. 
It shows Kamala Harris leading Donald Trump 50 to 46 percent in a two-way race. In a three-way race, which includes RFK Jr., Kamala still leads 48 to 44 with RFK Jr. at 4 percent. Former Southern Baptist Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission Executive Director Russell Moore went on a podcast from Christianity Today to counter-signal oppo research on Tim Walz's stolen valor. Over the past couple of days, even some of the most salient of those issues are pretty much off the table. I mean, the 2020 George Floyd riots that Mike mentioned, ABC News now has audio of Donald Trump at the time saying, Tim Walz handling, this is the way you do it. This guy was tough. He's sending in the National Guard. And the conversation has been over the past several days, not that, but really ridiculous kinds of quibbles about his National Guard record when he retired. And I saw this morning that he said he was coach when he was assistant coach, when he took the team to to the championship. I mean, you got to get stronger than that. Stolen valor is now a ridiculous quibble quote, according to Russell Moore. Got it. Accidental acts of journalism update. Now that Joe Biden is out of the way, the media have stumbled upon a newfound interest in Hunter Biden's shady foreign business deals. It was reported at the New York Times yesterday that the younger Biden lobbied U.S. officials for help with regulatory issues for the Ukrainian energy company Burisma, of which he was sitting on the board when his father was vice president. An enormous amount of social security numbers and other sensitive information from millions of people could be in the hands of a hacking group after a data breach and may have been released on an online marketplace. The Los Angeles Times reported this week the hacking group USDOD claimed it had allegedly stolen personal records, including the social security numbers and home addresses of 2.9 billion people from national public data. That's a firm that provides background check data to employers and investigators. This is all according to a class action lawsuit filed in U.S. District Court in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The breach was believed to have happened in or around April of 2024, according to the lawsuit. And finally, I'm sure even Steve, the guy with the maize and blue man cave, will join me in affixing a few big old Buckeye helmet stickers to end the montages this week. First, we start with Ohio State players who showed up to fall camp wearing overtly pro-Christ t-shirts, including a number of players donning shirts declaring Jesus won. I love the use of the past tense there. Star running back Travion Henderson promoted his teammates' declaration and urged others to spread the name of Jesus. Secondly, former Buckeye quarterback and current ESPN College game day host Kirk Herbstreet was asked on X recently whether men should be allowed to compete in women's sports, to which he replied, of course not. Ridiculous question. But he didn't stop there. He went on Dan Dockich's show on Outkick.com and doubled down. You had to know that when you put that tweet out, there was going to be a reaction. Come on. You had to know. I, I didn't give a shit, though. I, I, I yeah, don't really give yeah. a shit at all. Like, I'm yeah. done giving any shit at all about any of it. Um, when it comes to, it's almost like there are two different sets of rules. And, um, if you, if you have a view that's a little bit more traditional or, you know, I'm a Christian guy, um, it's like, there's a different set of rules for, for, for that viewpoint. And it's hard to just turn the other cheek time after time after time. So yeah, I didn't. I didn't really care, I, and I don't care at all, um, which is a good thing. I think it's good and healthy to get to that place uh, compared to, you know, oh, gosh, I don't want to get canceled. I don't want to get people upset. I don't give a shit. You know, I'm just going to say certain <laughs> things. When I, My problem is I have a temper, and so if I get to that point, if that fuse gets lit, I let it go, and then I'll – explode and say something so that i have to be careful of and there's another big old buckeye helmet sticker and that's what happened while we were away kirk curb street's never been hotter than he is right now there it is man never been hotter than he is right now i'm telling you having met him a few times and interviewed him a few times in person good looking dude i'm not gay i'm not heading that way those blue eyes man are something you can get lost in those things i mean even trying to interview him, they're a distraction Okay, but and it's just not a Lindsey Graham thing, just an admiration thing. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Like you look in that shirt, Todd. And I think that's it for today. We'll be back again tomorrow. No. <laughs> I love doing that to him. <laughs> no, listen, man. I'm in. Go Bucks. 
I mean, I'm in. You bet. It's more important than anything else, the stuff that uh, Buckeye Kirk Herb Street's saying there and those shirts those guys are wearing, you bet. Aaron's Montage brought to you by our friends over at Relief Factor. If you are like, it is my lot in life, I'll never be active again, might be true. I mean, we do get older. We do die. Check the death rate again today. Still 100%, in fact. Okay, so these bodies aren't the glorified ones were promised later. They don't last forever. So it, it could be you're on your, literally on your last legs. It could also, though, be you've, you've maybe given up a little early. Why not bet 20 bucks to see if you don't see a difference in three weeks or less with our friends over at Relief Factor. They're, it's the supplement created by physicians who can prescribe drugs, but they wanted to create something drug-free that would go after the cause of much of our chronic pain. That's too much inflammation in the joints, and that supplement is Relief Factor. Over the years... Over a million people have taken the three-week quick start challenge. 70% of them stuck around long-term because of the results they saw in three weeks or less. So what do you got to lose for 20 bucks? Why don't you see if you don't see a difference in your pain in three weeks or less at relieffactor.com. Get the three-week quick start at relieffactor.com. All right, a couple of things that I want to um, to mention that – I I think actually all tie into the same story, okay? I want to start with uh, polls. Yesterday, Fox News put out a poll, showed Trump up by one nationally. When you look at the cross tabs of the Trump poll, they have Trump winning Hispanics. No, I'm sorry, Trump getting, uh, yeah. No, he had the second highest vote with Hispanics of all time, 39%. No, I'm confusing Trump, this with the uh, Quinnipiac poll. The, the Fox poll had Trump winning Hispanics, getting a tie with Suburbans, and getting, I think it's 20% of the black vote, or 19, which is right around 20. If Donald Trump does that, guys, he's going to win 30 states. All right? So, I mean, Fox is a notoriously bad pollster. Um, Emerson as we have pointed out and walked you guys through in our overtime a few days ago, Emerson's been the most accurate pollster of this entire, of the last couple of cycles. And from, from the mainstream perspective, and it's really not even close. It's not like I, I, if you had me rank, you know, cause I'm factoring in the 2022 midterms as well. And Emerson also polls state races too. Senate, um, governor, um, individual electoral college battles, By far, and it's not even close, Emerson's been the most successful pollster. So I think I said in the overtime on Monday, if you want to come up with your own accurate polling average, I would go with Rasmussen, which is very biased towards Trump. But their pro-Trump bias is actually not as bad as the anti-Trump bias. And so that's why, as much as everybody laughs at Rasmussen, I just tell you the data, okay? You know, I just, that's all I care about. And the data is Rasmussen's actually been more accurate than the corporate media polling since 2016. Virtually every corporate media poll, Rasmussen's been more accurate then. So I would probably take Rasmussen with a pro-Trump bias to counteract the um, anti-Trump bias that exists everywhere else. And then I would combine it with Emerson, average those two things out, and you probably have a pretty good idea of where things are as much as we can in an era where it's tough to get people to respond to polls when everybody's on a mobile phone. But you have to understand there's a reason why Emerson's so much better at this than everybody else is. Okay. Um, Quinnipiac put up, put out a poll yesterday that Kamala was winning Pennsylvania by five points. Quinnipiac is one of the most quoted media pollsters. They're one of the worst. They're awful. Every cycle, they're dreadful. They're appallingly bad. In their final poll of 2020, they had Joe Biden winning Pennsylvania by seven points. He won it by one point. Okay? I mean, they're just terrible. They're, they're awful. But you have to understand why these people suck at this. Most, I don't even, most of us don't even know where Emerson College is. It's, it's because they're actually doing polling. They're not pushing a narrative. And these corporate media outlets, just like we saw during COVID, I, I didn't go cloak and dagger 
put myself in a Connor Stallion's disguise on the Central Michigan sideline. So I'm dressed up like Patrick Dempsey. Infiltrated the Denmark National Institute of Health. And I was able to crack their algorithm and get into their database and their mainframes to find out what the true COVID data in Denmark was. And then I managed to escape in the cover of, nar- in the cover of darkness only to heroically whistleblow and release this important information to the planet. Denmark published the information on their website. I went on the website. I ran it through Google Translate so it would be in English. And I copied and pasted what they said. And then I just reported it. That was my very complicated data acquisition operation. It's just they're planning and counting on most people aren't going to look. They're just going to look at what's not, what they report at the top and not look at what's underneath. How many times during the COVID era did we read headlines of studies and, that, that, were, that were in the media guys and then we'd like read the first two or three lines from the study itself and it was just mm-hmm. completely contradictory to the headline you were being sold. They're, they're counting on laziness. So most people will not look at the cross tabs of these polls. Most people won't do so with the knowledge base, frankly, that someone that has the experience I have working in politics does. And then on top of that, even if you did, you probably wouldn't have the historical benchmarks of understanding how election demographics historically have broken down because you're not a nerd whose wife would swear you're a perpetual virgin if she didn't have your kids like me, okay, with a photographic memory so you can instantly recall all these things. And then in case you forget, you literally keep files of stuff so that you can go back and refer to them later. I'm that guy. Okay. So I know. Really hot living with me on a Saturday night. But that's, that's me. All right. So many of these polls are concocting a world in a universe that cannot exist. But you have to understand their point is not to poll. Emerson is good at this because their point is to poll. Rasmussen is pretty good at this because their point is to counter the biased polls with their own bias. And therefore, it kind of evens itself out. All right. Almost all of these corporate media polls are for the advancement of a narrative. The promulgation of talking points. And it ties right into what we're seeing with the charm offensive... As far as I know, the night of June 27th, uh, you know, on the desk there down in Dallas at the Blaze after the debate, I might have been the first person to predict all the events that we have seen since that debate playing themselves out right now. Might have been. Maybe someone else beat me to the punch. If that's you, movie be in. Okay. But even though I saw the, the, the PR onslaught that was going to make Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift look, uh, you know, subtle coming back on June 27th, even as we live through it right now, I have to tell you guys, it's it's something to behold, even as we live through it right now. Right? Thinking, contemplating it is not quite the same thing as being, you know, literally waterboarded by it. Right? Here's the thing you need to understand. As as I mentioned yesterday, this is the end of the beginning. This is phase one. We're in the foreplay phase. Next week, Flat out Caligula levels of orgiastic consummation are going to take place called the Democratic Convention. But that won't even be the climax. No, that's going to be actually after the convention. Because that's also when the most watched programming in America debuts right after the convention. Todd, what is it? You know what it is. What is it? What's the most watched programming in America? Football. Football. That's not even close. Not even close. Every year, the most watched programs in America are always live sporting events or all football, live football events. Every year, it's not even close. Not even close. Not even close. NFL preseason games on network TV draw more ratings than most of their big budget television series do. And I can promise you. You're getting a Kamala money shot. There's going to be more money shots than an Amber Rose only fans. Those first two weekends of the of the football season, college and pro, you're going to think the entire 2024 football season is brought to you by Kamala Harris. 
you're going to see more gratuitous centerfold shots of Kamala Harris than you'd see if you watched the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders on the love boat in 78. It's going to be legion everywhere because they need to build up her her persona as much as they can before they have to let her out into the wild on September 10th at that first debate. Which will all be structured in her favor, but will still be somewhat off script. She'll have to actually talk. But all of this is to create a narrative that justifies winning Pennsylvania by half a point or a point, winning Georgia by, what was it, 13,000 votes, I think it was in 2020, uh, winning Arizona by Nevada by 20, 30,000 votes. They're constructing that narrative right now. So it is not that most of these polls outside of Emerson and a couple of others are real, but their impact is very real. You should not believe them, but you should not ignore them. For the same kinds of psyops you're seeing with these polls are what prompted people without skepticism at all to just instantly start wearing chokers because everybody told them masks, studies show, masks stop the spread of coronavirus. So everybody just started choking themselves and their children out. And then enforcing those exact same things on everybody else. That's what we're undergoing right now. Now, the temptation on our side will be to just whine and lament this. Now, I actually do think we need to call BS on these polls. I'm half tempted just to spend the next 82 days just going commodus on X with every poll, whether it's legit or not, based on it, not on its conclusions, but based on its own you know, math, how it got to the conclusions it's stating it. It's possible Donald Trump could win, you know, the general election by one point, but he's not going to win Hispanics. He's not going to get 20% of the black vote, get a tie in the suburbs and only win by one point. That would be like a 30 state level blowout. It's, it's possible Kamala may win. YouGov put out a poll yesterday, plus 10 Democrat sample. That would be the largest Democrat sample in a, in, in a presidential election since we've been keeping exit polls. The biggest ever was plus eight with Obama in 2008. That's not going to happen either. But you have to understand, the vast majority of people, right or left, won't look at the, at this in, the internal aspects of, of how they are coming to their conclusions. They won't. They'll just look at the headline and react. And then they'll spread that reaction and it gets into the water table. So then what is it we have to then focus then on what we can control. And when you look at the fundamentals of this race, we have some we have some fundamental problems, I believe. We got annihilated during the off year, mid year um, special election season a year ago. There's never been any form of polling cycle this entire year for Republicans on the congressional ballot that was positive to them. Much of the much much of the electorate has been driven by I don't want to vote for either Trump or Biden. And then when people saw that Biden's age was even worse than they thought, that became the driving force for about two, three weeks, right? And they got rid of that. Then they had to turn they then they had to reinvent Kamala. That's what's occurring right now. Now, it is possible she could go out there on September 10th in that first ABC debate and, and fall on her face. But what the number one thing I'm concerned about is not these polls, because I can see what they're, what they're doing and what they are. The number one thing I'm concerned about is when I look at the fundamentals of the race, fundraising, organization, digital messaging and advertising, we are demonstrably behind. Demonstrably behind. And those are things we can control. What concerns me is if, if we don't control the things we can control, what's our theme this year on the show, by the way? Dominion. That's right. If we don't take dominion over the things that we can control, we are going to be left for the next 82 days 
needing something that we can't control to organically occur. We're going to need Kamala to face plant in front of 100 million people on September 10th, like Joe Biden did on June 27th. We're going to need a Comey, something like a Comey letter that we could have never forecasted in the last week before the 2016 election. We're going to need maybe some kind of global calamity none of us want, frankly. Iran just straight up attacks Israel. Uh, Putin drops a nuke on Ukraine. The kind of thing that's not good. But I, I don't like just letting things happen to me. I'm not a fan of that. Never have been. Rather would try, I'd rather take my chances solving my problems with aggression. And then if, you, if, you, if, you, if it was too hasty or you overreacted, you've got time to course correct. But passivity just means you run out of time. And I kind of, I'm beginning to sort of feel like I did in the aftermath of the 2020 election. When I sat there the night of the election pointing out incongruencies in the election returns that I did not buy live on the air here on The Blaze and went, and went on the air with that the very next day and got the entire Blaze channel demonetized on Facebook because I did that starting on Beck's show. But you guys remember those shows we did from the first Tuesday in November until um, Electoral College yeah. certification day in December? And I well. kept looking at my watch. I said, guys, the clock is ticking. All right, we're, we're chasing all these theories and everything else and things we couldn't possibly prove. And, and we need to point out what's the chain of custody of these ballots? Where did they come from? What are the signatures? How is it possible that we have, a, we have less of a void uh, rate even though we, in, in mail-in voting than we've ever had, even though it's the highest volume of mail-in voting we've ever had. Th- these are things that we can fight on right now in the limited amount of time we have, but they're gonna, they're, the Electoral College is going to meet that first week in December. They're going to certify this election. So what are we doing here? What is the plan? I mean, we're just following rabbit trails and spinning out of control, but the clock is ticking. We're going to run out of time. The game will end, right? We did, all, how, we did that show for how many weeks, right? I'm, I'm beginning to feel like this again. They're, the election, they're going to start voting in less than a month in North Carolina and Virginia and Pennsylvania. They're going to do that, guys. That's going to happen. All right. They're going to start voting here this time next month in all three of those states. That's going down. Whether our ducks are in a row or not, they're not going to, we don't get to call a timeout. Hey, can we put the whole thing off? We're not, no, that's happening. You see what I'm saying here? Mm-hmm. November 5th, the rest of the country's all voting. That's going to go down. And I and I'm 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 concerned. Gentlemen, your thoughts. Well, it's the weather. It's not a new uh, theme. So there is the potential uh, for Trumpian surprises uh, down the road. But I, this is I I didn't go in truly expecting anything uh different actually you know getting in on the trump thing after the uh assassination attempt for me had more to do with the people awakening than donald trump quite frankly and that doesn't seem to be going so well either we're all the weather and the forecast is bad This is not really fundamentally different from any any election in my semi-adult and now adult life. When we talk from a Republican GOP perspective, 2012 with mid, 2000. Let's go back to 2008 with John McCain, just doing the same things, taking your base for granted. Oh no, we don't. We don't say his middle name. It just that that posture, kind of the same thing. 2012, take your base for granted. Don't eat a chicken sandwich. 2020, you know that was a weird year, but we're just trying to run the same playbook that hasn't worked, from my perspective. And the definition of insanity is the Republican Party. <laughs> More in a moment.
All right, back here on the Steve Day Show. If, if you are exceedingly brave, I think is how I'll describe it. And you're like, you know what? I think I'm going to put my house up for sale. Or I think I'm going to go look for a new house. Not because you like have to. It's like a job or nothing. But you're like, yeah, why not? I'm going to snake plisk in this thing. No, you're not. <laughs> this is the most challenging real estate market when you look at the combination of interest rates, mortgage payments, home values, the discretionary income the American people have at their disposal at the moment. It is arguably the most challenging environment, uh, real estate environment in American history right now. So make sure you go in with an agent that you can trust. He'll be your snake Pliskin. All right. Um, you'll, you'll escape from uh, the Let's Go Brandon real estate market, whether it's across the, the country, whether it's across town, wherever you want or need to go. We've got an agent for you whose track record of success has been validated, verified. Otherwise, we wouldn't recommend them to you. We wouldn't refer them to you. And a lot of times, these are agents from right here in the Blaze audience. So you guys have a value system in common as well. If you're looking for an agent you can trust, and believe me, right now you are more than ever before. Head over to realestateagentsitrust.com. Again, head over to realestateagentsitrust.com. Joined now by Pastor Joel Webbin. I'm going to be speaking at a conference he is hosting next year. We'll tell you about that here in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, also this upcoming election and uh, what should pro-lifers be doing uh, in that regard. Joel, good to see you again, brother. How are you? Good to see you, Steve. Thanks for ha- having me on the show. So, Joel, my, my, correct me if I'm wrong. You kind of describe yourself as uh, one of those cra- crazy abolitionists, right? That uh, even the uh, even the pro-life uh, intelligentsia thinks is just too radical to be heard or considered. Is that a good, adequate description of uh, your position on the issue? Yes, sir. One of those crazy guys that believes the law of God is good. <laughs> and so you literally think just ab- abortion ought to be abolished in and of itself as a practice, period, end of sentence. Do not pass go. Do not right. collect $200. We're not going to diagram the sentence. It's just a subject and a predicate, and we're done here. That's kind of where you're coming from? Right. And Steve, you're not ignorant of this at all, but I, a lot of the pro-life you know, industry is uh, they just they, they want to split the penny a million ways, but they don't actually have an in- interest in uh, actually ending abortion. And that's not to you know demean every single pro-life you know, organization, but there's a lot of big pro-life ink uh, that makes a lot of money. It is you know, they are highly incentivized to ensure that abortion doesn't end, but in fact continues. And we just split the penny, split the penny, split the penny. If, if you've got a Second, I can, I can outline real quick in about 45 to 60 seconds what the abolitionist position is. Sure. If you're interested. Yeah, our audience okay. has heard from uh, this position a few times, but they can hear from it again. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So abolitionists, basically, what the, what they're going to say is that um, abortion has to stop um, absolutely, and the, the, in a nutshell, the primary way to explain that is equal protection. So if you think of like three dots, you know, and it's a straight line connecting these three dots, they're not far away. You know, uh, anybody could connect these dots. It's pretty simple. Um, You basically have equal dignity, and then that leads to equal protection, that leads to equal penalties. And what we mean by that is that uh, if we believe that the unborn child is a human being created in the image of God with the same uh, degree of value and innate dignity as a born human being, uh, so it's not half of a life or three quarters of a life, it's no less dignified than the born person. The unborn child is just as dignified as the born person. So that's equal dignity. If it's equal dignity, then you've got to, to, to actually put your money where your mouth is and say, well, I believe that the unborn child is just as valuable in the sight of God as somebody who's 50 years old. If you really are saying that, then you have to put in place the same equal protections for the unborn child, which means you can't have, you know, it's open hunting season on the unborn. If we did that with any other class of people, uh, you, you would never hear the end of it because it's wicked and unjust. So to say, well, this group of people over here, um, you can murder them with impunity or you can murder them, but you know, you'll get a slap on the wrist. You'll get a fine. No, it, whatever the penalty is for homicide, that should be the penalty for abortion. So equal dignity means equal Equal protections and equal protections. The way that we protect life is through penalties, severe penalties for taking life. So any law that says uh, that abortion, the penalty for an abortion is less than that of homicide, would be um, an unequal penalty, which means it's an unequal protection. Which means, if we're honest, we have to say that the unborn child has unequal dignity. We do not believe that that child is fully human. 
Um, hmm. That's that's the point. So all that being said, uh, as it pertains to the abolitionists, what, what abolitionists are going to say is that when it comes to presenting bills, they have to be bills that God would approve of. They have to be just bills. You can't say, hey, you can murder on Wednesday, but but you can't murder on Thursday. Or, you you know, a heartbeat bill, you know, you, you, you can murder a child who's this many weeks old, but not, not a child that's past that. Uh, no, it needs to be uh, a just bill, a bill that you can stand before uh, God with a clear conscience. And so it has to be a just bill with equal penalties, equal protection that, that say signifies equal dignity. Uh, same thing with running candidates. Now, here's the thing, and I think I think you'll agree with this, Steve. Um, so Exodus chapter 18, this is what the, the abolitionists are always going to go to. It's um, the context is Moses in the wilderness. There's like 2 million Israelites, give or take at this point. Most biblical scholars and historians say 1 to 2 million Israelites. Uh, the father-in-law of Moses, he does a great job. He comes in, gives some fatherly wisdom. He says, hey, Moses, you can't be the sole arbiter of all things right, moral, and true. Uh, there's too many Israelites, and you're standing at the front of your tent all day long trying to you know, mediate every single conflict that comes your way. And, and one guy to do that for a million to 2 million people is just impossible. So you you need to set up some some leadership, right? So so most people are familiar with this. So then that's the context. Skipping forward a little bit, verse 20. This is where you get the standard. Uh, so this is God speaking through Jethro. So that's not just Jethro's idea, but this is this is God's standard. He says, uh, you shall, uh, verse 21, so Exodus 18, 21. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God. So that's one of the, the standards. Uh, men who fear God, you could technically say the first standard is from all the people, right? So not foreigners, uh, but it actually needs to be Israelites overseeing Israelites. So from the people, men who fear God, men who are trustworthy, who hate a bribe, uh, and then place these men as chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Here's the deal. Um, guys are trying abolitionists and, and, you know, uh, different, different Christians who I love. And I am, I'm one of those guys. Uh, they're trying to apply that to a federal presidential election in, in a, a general election, not the primaries. Uh, but that is not the system. So we, we're not changing the standard. This is God's standard. They, they hate a bribe. They, they fear God. They're trustworthy. That's the standard. And I know a guy, Steve, and you might know this guy too, but I know a guy who, uh, almost got to the point of being in insufferable for about nine months uh, because he was saying, I don't care about MAGA. I don't care about all the Trump supporters. Uh, my whole life with the GOP, we've always complained about not having a good candidate with good values. And here's a guy who actually has them, AKA Ron DeSantis. And I'm going to stand behind him knowing that it's going to hurt maybe my ratings and it's not going to put any dollars in my pocket, but I'm going to stand behind him because I'm a Christian and I have standards and it's the primaries and I'm going to do this thing. And then, um, it didn't work out, but as soon as the primaries were over, um, this guy that I know, uh, he immediately switched his tune. He said, we did everything we could to honor the Lord, but now we have a binary choice between somebody who wants to destroy the nation and somebody who wants to take us back to the 1990s. And I love our country. I love my family. I love my kids. I love my wife. And so, yeah, we're, uh, we're going to vote for Trump. That's you. Correct. I think that's the correct that's the correct position. So my point is Exodus 18 verses 21, 22, 23. Um, the way that that applies, that is the standard. So any any hardcore Christian, God bless them. I love them. They, they, they love the law of God. They don't want to compromise. I get it. Um, that is the standard. We're not changing the standard. What we're asking is how do we apply this standard in a system that's entirely different than Israel's system under Moses? Because here's the deal. When Moses says this, uh, these are the qualifications for the guys who are going to be over thousands thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. He's saying to the people, you go and find me those guys that meet the standard. And then the guys bring, you know, the people bring these guys to Moses and then Moses has the vetoing power. That is not our system. Our, our system in the primaries is we bring those guys. And I think so in the primaries, uh, whether it's a local election or a federal election, that's where Exodus 18, the standard comes into play. Here's God's standard. It applies even for us today. You need guys who fear the Lord, who, who hate a bribe and so on and so forth. So in the primary, these are the guys that you bring to the proverbial Moses. But when Moses says, sorry, uh, we don't like any of your guys. We don't like DeSantis. We don't like this person. We don't like that person. We're sending all your, your guys home. Everything you just did was a waste. Um, and now we're going to give you a binary choice. You've got crap, and then you have a steaming hot pile of crap that's uh, acid you know, filled and, and will melt the whole world. Um, at, at that point, we're outside of Exodus 18. At that point, uh, we're not breaking God's standard. We are not compromising by saying, I'm going to cast a vote for Donald Trump, even though I don't know 
though if he really fears the Lord or even though he has compromised, he has objectively compromised on the pro-life stance. Those things are true, um, but but Exodus 18, I think, applies to primaries. It does not apply to general presidential federal elections. So, so what would you say, because I, I am looking at the amount of time here, because between the two of us, we're going to maybe get one more question in. Um, so what would you say yeah. about, I'm very frustrated that there is a layer of Christian, particularly in the suburbs, that is not MAGA, but not communist. And most of them go to churches that have told them that uh, thou must be nice in all things is the, com- is the 11th commandment God forgot to put in the original draft. OK, and the, and the one issue that they are permitted in their megaopolis pottery barn wannabe churches to even remotely get radicalized on is abortion. That's the that's the one. OK, that's that's the right. that's the one thing that we it's not necessarily political if we address it is that. OK. And of course, he's running on the weakest pro-life platform and messaging in the entire history of the Republican Party. Ironically, at the same time, he's running on the strongest record any Republican presidential president has actually right. ever had. OK, so there's this there's this division about this. And my, my concern is it's frankly going to cost us two to four points of voters that we otherwise would get because of what he is doing and not messaging to them uh, right. and in a way that would get their votes. So right. what would be your past? One of those people comes into your church, comes in, you know, says he finds out you're a pastor and, ex- and expresses this concern to you. How would you counsel them as a pastor? This is how I would counsel them. I would say, would, did you did you vote for George Bush? Um, did did you vote for, uh, you know, all the the whole line of over the last 50 years? Did you vote for Reagan if they're old enough, you know, to have voted for Reagan? Um, all these uh, GOP, you know, Republican candidates. Here's the deal. Um, I, I I don't know their hearts. God alone sees their hearts. Uh, but but Roe allowed um, it allowed Republicans to pretend. Uh, and the guy who actually got rid of Roe, which was Donald Trump, you can love him, hate him, you know, whatever, but like he got rid of Roe. Um, now, all of a sudden, the veil has been lifted. And what we're finding is, OK, yeah, Trump is compromised. Uh, turns out all these Republicans are compromised, mm-hmm. all of them. It's not like Trump is unique. It's not, it's, it's not that he's special. Um, it was real easy to give Bible verse lip service in order to secure the evangelical voting bloc uh, when you actually intended you would run in terms of your campaign. But in terms of actually governing once being in office, uh, none of these guys were pro-life. It's not like Trump is less pro-life than George Bush. Uh, his, his, his rhetoric is less pro-life, but his actions were, were more pro-life than, than anybody else. So the last thing I'll say is this, Steve. Uh, what, one of the things that I tell the people, um, my parishioners in my church, is I say, uh, you will never abolish abortion in America if you don't have an America. Hmm. I have been a one-issue voter for a very long time. It is radical for me, uh, and I'll admit this is novel. I'm, I, I'm still getting used to this. Uh, I'm not saying it's a bigger issue, but it is creeping up and becoming the second biggest issue that, that I that, that you could possibly imagine, and that is immigration. Um, we if we get Kamala, we could get 20 million. Right. Because just what we're counting is like 12 to 15 million. And we haven't even finished a four year term of Biden. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's illegal plus legal. And and that's just what we're counting. It could be even more than that. You could get 20, conceivably 20, 30 million people. And here's the thing. When you import the third world uh, and people do studies and say, well, they're actually conservative, you know, people from India, you know, are pro-life or people that that's fine. Uh, but if you look at their voting patterns and there are plenty of statistics that bear this out, if you look at the voting patterns of people who import into the country, uh, they ultimately, at the end of the day, even if they're pro-life or traditional marriage, they're they going vote to vote for more government. They yes, and Every they time. also they they vote for the party that's going to let their friends and family come Correct. in too. That's who they're going to vote they, for. They're, they're yes. leaving their countries because their welfare states and and, and systems are broken, right. and so they exactly. want to. So they want to come here where we have a vibrant welfare state and open borders, so they can bring even more of their people here to take advantage of it. That's just a simple so, fact. So of, you want to abolish abortion? Yeah. Praise God, that's great. Um, how are we going to abolish abortion when we're up against uh, in 2028, 20 to 30 million more Democrat voters? Correct. That's what you're looking at. Yeah. That's a great angle there, Joel. Tell us about the event I'm speaking at with you guys next spring. Yeah, so um, it's it's um, 
called Christ is King, uh, How to Defeat Trash World is the subtitle. How to Defeat Trash World. We've got a, um, a super jam-packed uh, lineup. It's going to be uh, April 3rd, 4th, and 5th. That's a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Hold over for April 6th, the Lord's Day, if anybody wants to join us for church. But we've got uh, 15 speakers. We've got Stephen Wolf. He wrote The Case for Christian Nationalism. We've got Jeff Durbin, who is uh, an abolitionist. He's uh, with Apologia Church in Phoenix, Arizona, co-pastors with uh, James White. We've also got... Um, we've We've got the Ogden, Utah guys. That's Brian Sauve, Eric Kahn, Dan Burkholder, Ben Garrett. We've got Steve Dace. Uh, we've got Orrin McIntyre, who's also with The Blaze. He's com- uh, coming and joining us. So we've got like 15 different speakers, three full days. It's going to be eight main sessions, and we're going to have four hour and a half long each, four panels. We're going to be doing uh, discussions and even some informal, friendly debates about uh, th- things like this, like, you know, like uh, w- w- what is the abolitionist stance and, you know, or things like uh, Christian nationalism. Um, is it a good idea? Is it something we should back off of? Those kinds of things. So it's April 3rd, 4th, and 5th, Thursday through uh, Saturday. And you just go to rightresponseconference.com, rightresponseconference.com. And right now we have the early bird pricing, but it's ending on uh, August 31st. So we only have like two more weeks. Uh, the early bird pricing is 140 bucks for an adult, but we've done a, a special promo code for all the guys who listen to the Steve Day Show. So if you type in uh, DACE, D-E-A-C-E, then you can get $10 off the ticket, which takes you from 140 all the way down to 130 uh, starting in September next month, just two weeks away. Uh, we're going to be close to probably about $200 for an adult. So you can get it for a buck 30 if you type in days uh, with the promo code and get the early bird pricing. You can go right now, rightresponseconference.com. Rightresponseconference.com. And if you want the discount, just use my last name, rightresponseconference.com. Good to see you, Joel. Thank you. Thank you. I think that is a pretty blunt assessment and just literally pick any issue you want you can you can want to do this and do this and do this for america all you want but if we don't have america then there's what it's kind of a a pointless exercise todd your thoughts yeah and still nothing of what is said should be taken to mean you we're insisting you vote for trump i would make no such demand of you and your conscience but when he talks about you put your best foot forward, when he describes Steve, you do everything you can, which has basically been Steve's career. There's a much better alternative right over here. And then sometimes after he's lost, Steve says, no, I'm not voting for that. In this case, he says he is. But either way, realizing that if you're going to shake the dust from your feet from a particular candidate, like many of you say you are, but you're you're just living... Basically, like, there's nothing of consequence going on in the West that we're not on a razor's edge right here. That's a problem. You're just going to go Netflix and chill through this thing. Everybody's making compromises. I don't think you're just going to go off and do your own private Idaho thing. I think you're lying about that. And therefore, your pressure on us about Trump is not fair. They won't let you do your private Idaho thing anyway. Even if you are serious and want to try it, they won't let you do it anyway. All right, back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre. Let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. You can do that by emailing us, Steve at SteveDace.com, D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Dace Show on X, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also, if you enjoy the podcast version, thank you. You're a big part of our show's audience. Please hit subscribe or follow if you're on iTunes. Also, leave us a five-star review if you're on iTunes or anywhere else and you enjoy the podcast. And we thank you for each and every one of those. Uh, We're brought to you by our friends over at Hillsdale. They're one of the last remaining universities in America, not completely given over to the spirit of the age. In fact, they're pushing back on that spirit of the age. To that end, you can go watch their inspiring portrayal of Thomas Jefferson as he reflects on the meaning of the Declaration of Independence in a letter he wrote later in his life. Right now, you can go watch that at daceforhillsdale.com. F-O-R, daceforhillsdale.com, the perfect back-to-school uh, you know, I guess antidote 
immunization. <laughs> All right. Uh, Daceforhillsdale.com. You can also go there and get a free commemorative copy of the Declaration of Independence as well. Dace for F O R Dace for Hillsdale.com. All right, let's get to it. And Theology Thursday, as we continue on going through the book of Romans, verse by verse. Last week we talked about Romans 3.23 and Romans 3.24. Paul saying, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is now in Christ Jesus, right? And so the paradigm of all of us being born into sin, meaning we have a propensity to disobey God, which is why no matter how adorable your child is, you don't ever have to teach them to be selfish. You don't ever have to teach them to be cruel. You don't have to teach them to be disobedient. You don't have to teach them the word mine or no. They just instinctively know those kinds of things, right? And sometimes this is referred to as original sin, okay? But now there is a new paradigm being introduced, that we can be saved from our own sinfulness, that there can be redemption, okay? Now, what is the act of redeeming? What is that? Well, a great analogy would be, for example, when you have a coupon, right? Now, you can't you can't print your own coupon, right, guys? You can't make up your own coupon, put your own barcode on it, go to the store and say, you know, I, I purchased enough of this product, and I've bought and I've bought enough from your store that I've earned the right to redeem some of 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 my own uh, cost here. Can I can I do that? Well, no, not if you're sane. But yes. this is the Biden Harris yeah, yes. economy. Yeah, they they won't take your coupon, guys. Your coupon is paid for by whom? The manufacturer. The manufacturer pays for the coupon. And when you give that coupon paid for by the manufacturer, another, what's a synonym for manufacturer, by the way? Creator. When you submit the coupon paid for by the creator and the manufacturer, the store is not taking less money, is it? The store is not like, oh, I guess we were going to, we had that product on our shelves for $5.87. I, I guess we're going to give it to you for $4.87. And we're just going to eat that dollar. We're going to eat that buck over and over again, depending on how many people bring that coupon in. Is that how it works? No. The manufacturer or the creator has already offered up, you might say, a propitiation on your behalf as, as their consumer. They've already purchased the full price of that product for you. And that is why the store is now accepting your coupon. Because the full cost has been redeemed. Yes, follow me with this so far? Yes. So there's there's no amount of effort that you could expend. None. No amount of effort where you're like, I've spent so much at this store. I've bought this product so many times. I've earned the right now to not have to keep paying for it. I earned it on my own. You can't do that. You're not the creator. You're not the manufacturer. That, that is not within your purview. When you attempt to take something and claim something that is not yours, we have a very complicated uh, stained glass window term for that. Do you guys know what it is? Stealing? Stealing. Yeah, you can't do that. It's bad. Stealing bad. I think there's a command. That is one of the commandments, right? Don't steal stuff. Don't take stuff that doesn't belong to you. Okay? And so what it means to be redeemed through Christ is exactly what Paul is going to say in the very next verse. Verse 25, chapter 3. Whom God, Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. What does that word mean? In offering a sacrifice. Just as the, the manufacturer or the creator, when you bring a coupon to a store, has made the sacrifice on your behalf. They're going to pay what you owe. They want you to have this product so bad. They're covering the cost or some of it. But the full cost will still be paid. 
just not by you. Someone else has offered a propitiation. The creator, the manufacturer has offered that propitiation in your place. But no one's eating it here. No one's just letting it slide. The store is still going to get its $5.87 for that product, folks. Still happening. It's just the manufacturer or the creator has offered to cover that cost. Made a propitiation. That's what it means. And that's how you, that's how, that's how redemption is received. Not by your works, not by your striving. Now, the Catholic Protestant argument is, what is the evidence for that redemption? Is it found in works? Is it found in faith? Is it found in faith that produces works? Is it found in works that demonstrate faith? Right, guys? That's, that's the traditional Catholic argument. Okay? But everyone agrees that the propitiation for our sins is made by Christ. And that is what Paul is arguing here. By what? What was the cost? Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. So later on in another one of his letters, when Paul will write, your life is not your own. You've been bought at a high price, or the word there actually could be translated as redeemed. What does that mean? Exactly what we're talking about right now. It's a reset of this theme right here in Romans. A man gave his blood for you. God gave, God became a man to give his blood for you. That is a high price. And as he says in the Gospel of John, there is no greater love than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. There is no higher price anyone can pay for you other than their own life. There's no higher price than that. No one has anything of higher value than their own life. And that was the cost. That was the propitiation necessary. Necessary for what? To satisfy. That's what propitiation means. A sacrifice made to satisfy a debt. And in this case, theologically, what it means is to satisfy the debt necessitated by the wrath of God as a result of our sins. And so when Jesus says at the cross, it is finished or it is accomplished, what he means is the wrath has been satisfied. The propitiation has been made. The debt has been paid. That's what it means. And the highest cost of them all, his own blood. whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God, God, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance or forgiveness, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. All right, gentlemen, who wants to go first here with your, uh, with your, commentaries and your own thoughts have at it Aaron yeah so a couple of thoughts first just on the structure of uh, this and the following verses because we'll be getting into into chapter four uh, very quickly these are not just random thoughts deep as they may be just kind of structured randomly no it's a very very logical uh, flow of um, flow of thought from chapter the end of chapter three into chapter four And we can discuss that more when we get to chapter four, probably next week. But this is this passage, these two, two, three verses might just be the most impactful, impactful verses on the posture of a professing Christian's life. Because it says a lot about a person's understanding of the holiness of God, whether they get this or not. And I'm not professing to be some sort of, none of us are. And I hope this goes without saying, oh, we've got this down pat. We understand this and we live this out. No, we don't. No, we don't. None of us do. So I want to give that as a a disclaimer to, to my thoughts on this. I had a, a, an acquaintance in college. We were in the same hall, I think, freshman year. Same media track. So we were around each other. A decent amount. Um, he was very weird, very odd. I, I think he's doing well. I don't know. And he would just say things that. Are you? 
Is something wrong with you? Is it some are you okay? One time he told me. He asked me. I kept a close eye on him after this. Uh, do you ever think do you ever think about what it would be like to kill somebody? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, 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 no. And let's just move on. Let's pretend that never happened. God doesn't do that with our sin. He doesn't do the uncomfortable laugh. Let's just move on with our sin. Our sin, your sin, my sin. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do the uncomfortable laugh that somebody do, that you do when somebody you know says something really weird or talks about uh, really weird voices in their heads. He doesn't just do the uncomfortable laugh and move on. No, sin will be punished. And that's the thrust of this passage here, is that we get justification. I mentioned this last week. Justification and forgiveness kind of mixed up or conflated. God set forth Christ, R.C. Sproul says, as a propitiation by his blood through faith that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Propitiation, I just want to underscore this, means to satisfy the demands of justice. A little bit different than forgiveness. The gospel is not simply an announcement of pardon. In justification, God does not merely decide unilaterally to forgive our sins. That is the prevailing idea that what happens in the gospel is that godly free, God freely uh, forgives us our sin because he's such a loving, dear, and wonderful God. And it does not disturb him that we violate everything that is holy. That's the prevailing idea, R.C. Sproul says. God never negotiates his righteousness. God will never lay aside his holiness to save us. God demands and requires that sin be punished. That's why the cross is a universal symbol of Christianity. Christ had to die because according to God, the propitiation had to be made. Sin had to be punished. Our sin has to be punished. This is why I say this is the most impactful, could be the most impactful verse when it comes to the posture of life for professing Christians. And I use that word, that qualifier, professing Christians, because that's going to come in a big time in the next chapter, the beginning of the next chapter. But that's going to be the biggest, if you understand this, and again, doing my best imperfectly to live this out. But if you understand, if you understand the abject nature of my sin and your sin, and it wasn't just merely forgiven, it was punished. It was severely punished. That should change your heart in ways that nothing else in this mortal coil could do. When you understand that it's just not some big fluffy guy in the, sky, in, in the clouds with a nice big old white beard like uh, Santa Claus who just, <laughs> that's, that's some cool sin, let's just move on and forget that happened. No, no, that was punished. Every but as much for you, for me, for every single human being. We have to understand that because I think too many of us go through professing Christians, go through life with the posture that uh, it's all right, it's okay, I'm still going to heaven one day. No, uh, well, you know, God bless us. If that's our posture when it comes to looking at our sin, I, I think there's something deeper going on with our hearts that needs to be fixed. Hmm. That prompts something here from, uh, from Charles Spurgeon. A little bit of faith will get you into heaven, but a lot of obedience will bring heaven to you. I think that we have to understand that God will have a recompense for everything should be terrifying that, that you will be forgiven in terms of the con in terms of condemnation to hell of your soul but the idea that there will still not be a recompense or consequences for your actions is not true but ultimately it's not that we have to obey we get to it's not that we have to repent it's that we get to. And this is why there must be a recompense. Because God does not owe us this. He doesn't owe any of us any of this. 
We are not owed a path to redemption. We are not owed a path to repentance. We're not even owed the offer of it. We're owed nothing. Nothing. Squat. Even people God knows that will reject him and never seek repentance, he still gives them the opportunity to marry, have children, be blessed, take gifts that he gave them and be successful with them. God's the only one here being taken advantage of. The only one. And so it is a pleasure, it is an honor to have his word revealed to us that if we severely limit the amount of women as men we have sex with to the ones we're married to at the time, just just pause right there for a second. And women, if you severely limit the amount of men you have sex with, in fact, for this day and age, let me even make this more circumspect. Men, if we severely limit whom we have sex with to only women that we happen to be married to at the time, and women, if you severely limit the people you have sex with to only men that you happen to be married to at the time, stop and think about the amount of trouble in this world by, by and large, just right there you would avoid. I mean, the, the, what are the odds you're going you're gonna to be presented with the option that have you considered killing your own child? The only time it even would be brought to you is in the case of a severe disability. But it's not going to be on your conscience at all to contemplate it. A divorce that has generational consequences for your family. Not 100%. There's other factors that can lead to the ruination of a marriage, right? But what, what is the more immediate ruination than that? Nothing. What it would do to you the amount of STDs and those sorts of things that get transmitted that can later on make it more difficult to have children or be fertile on either end. And I, I say this as someone that fully partook of much of the rancid water and wine of the sexual revolution in my era. Which is exactly why I know that this is true because I've got the scars from it to prove that it's true. Think of how much more, think of, think of how much less, less tension and anxiety you have in your life if you actually believe in the sovereignty of God. That doesn't eliminate that you might have a, a, cl a clinical mental health issue. That, 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 those happen. I live with that. But Amy would also tell you the more, the closer she is to God, the less her clinical symptoms are prevalent than the further away from God, she, when, than when she's further away from God. She'd tell you that. That's why she's in Christian. That's why she's a Christian therapist. That's why she became one exactly because of that. To help other people learn the same lesson that she had to learn. Obedience is the blessing, guys. In and of itself. I mean, there are Fortune 500 companies that are utterly godless and promote Pride Month, that will follow the financial lessons in the Book of Proverbs, and share them at board meetings. Further evidence, by the way, to what Paul said earlier in this book, we're a law unto ourselves. We know, right? I mean, if, you, if you're a Fortune 500 CEO and you're, you're following the financial advice and the stewardship advice in the book of Proverbs and ignoring the rest of the scriptures, you're kind of without excuse at that point, mm -hmm. right? You know, you know, you know where the power is. You know where the wisdom is. You know where the truth is. You know, you're acting on it. So you're without excuse. You knew. We know. Because we are so far afield from God in our sin, we look at obedience as this like impossible task or burden we could never want to, we could never carry on our own. Which, by the way, is true. We can't. But now that we have new life in Christ, now you can. Furthermore, now you want to. Now you're like, this way is better. Was there, do you guys think there was more or less tension in my life when there was more or less tension in my marriage? You guys, what do you think? What do you think? Uh, more and more. Yeah. Less and less. Correct. And the funny thing is, the more we walked away from our own uh, disobedience, Amy and I, and walked closer into obedience together, weirdly, the better our marriage got. Weird how that worked itself out. Huh. And then the better our lives got overall. 
and the less tension that was in our home overall, the less anxiety we each felt overall. Weird. Obedience is a blessing. It is the opportunity to live the way we were created originally to live before sin came into the world. Todd, your thoughts. Well, um, I, I have nothing to add within the confines of 25, if you'll allow me, uh, with 26. It All right, goes, let's read that verse then. You yeah. want to go there next? Okay. Because, oh, we did read 26. Go ahead. Yeah, because ahead. of the forgiveness of sins previously committed through the forbearance of God to prove his righteousness in the present time that he might be righteous and justified by the one who has faith in Jesus. Scott Hahn has been uh, taking uh, what uh, this chapter talks about in terms of breaking uh, the categories of Jew and Greek, and it's it's uh, caused us some uh, conversation. When I've said he's he's taken that even further, uh, why does when he said when talking about no one is righteous, not one, but the same Psalms he uses to prove that he those same Psalms talk about people being righteous, and then last time we talked about how does uh, faith apply to the disabled to babies in utero uh well it has to do with the forbearance uh of god and remember alpha and omega think of it in this it, it, uh he's come to redeem the time and space itself think of the uh, parable of the workers so the one who's been working the entire time and gets a wage and the one who shows up at the end gets a wage and there's a complaint and you recall uh, God's response to this. Well, it is in that light that I think Scott Hahn continues to talk about shattering our sense of categories. God has been exercising divine forbearance. In his mercy, he deferred or held back the full measure of his judgment on sin until a uniquely effective atonement could be made by his son. Paul locates this era of messianic grace and fulfillment in the present time. He then together then ties together his exposition of the righteousness of God by summarizing his two principal aspects. First, and this is the, I think the most important one, righteousness involves God showing himself to be righteous in his saving deeds, which project his fidelity and mercy onto the screen of human history for all to see. I mean, Steve, you've made this in a micro sense, this commentary about why, why Christ then? Rome, Rhodes. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, were well, under one Greco-Roman yes. culture, language, custom. Yes. The Romans had the early proto versions of Rhodes. Yes. They had, uh, they, as much as it was possible in that era, they had made um, mass transit via the sea waves, seaways as safe as they had ever been in human history because of their iron fisted control of most of them in the civilized world. Mm -hmm. This was really from the, from Babel on the, uh, until the ascension of Rome was really the first time that the, the mass delivering of a message outside of the gatekeepers of a, of a, of the world to the populace was really possible was that moment in history, the very first time. And because of how we think linearly, we, we, th we, we translate that forward. But if, if that works forward, we have to trust God's wisdom and how Christ at one particular time may also work back. He came to redeem all things. And what you guys said uh, in terms of defining uh, ex uh, expiation and propitiation is, is, is so important. But we limit its power and we cannot possibly have eyes to see as we as we pray we will have one day but he came to redeem all of creation and there's a very much uh when there's an automatic knee-jerk response of many christians about like we we run we won a lottery by living in the time we live in with christ but whatever happened before that is is damned to hell i i uh, that simply does not show the wisdom of what we are reading right here which is not to say I know how to connect those dots. I don't for you. But that uh, expiation the, and, and the mercy called forth because of it works in ways, thank God, that we cannot possibly understand. I mean, I can just look at it. 
you know, in my own life. I mean, ultimately I, you know, I was, I was raised in a home most people would call abusive. Okay. But the, the things that I, the things I was forced to learn, the amount of times we moved, the amount of times I felt isolated, the amount of times I felt alone, the amount of times I felt like I was not going to be supported for what I really thought was right. Okay. Even in my, even in that state when I was, you know, in an unregenerate state, but the lessons that I learned being in that environment prepared me for what God was going to call me to do in a regenerate state. It, he, it prepared me for feeling again, like I'm not being supported and I got to do what I think is right anyway, for standing up for what I believe, even if the crowd around me is hostile for not requiring a lot of affirmation from people that might therefore cause me to not do and say what I believe because I don't want to risk that affirmation. You see what I'm saying? Yes. I mean, that ultimately that, that, that the, the world that I lived in before, before I was form, I formally was called to salvation helped to shape me. Those events got allowed to happen to help to shape me for the, for what the role he was going to call me into after my salvation. If I had grown up in a better home, if I had grown up with more, a more supportive dad, frankly, I don't think I could have done this as effectively over these years as I did. I wouldn't, I, I, I would have, I, I would not have been as stubborn as necessary to be for this era as willing to stand up and say, I just think you're all wrong about this. And it's going to take a lot more to convince me than you're just your pressures and, and opinions. And if we can trust that in our own lives, I mm -hmm. think Christians do a better job of at least seeking out how we can trust that in God's, in the entirety of God's creation from beginning to end. Amen. Speaking of uh, the faith, our friends at First Liberty have been on the front lines of protecting religious liberty for many, many years. They're deeply concerned about uh, uh, Dementia Joe's plan to reform the Supreme Court, which is to essentially take away the things about the court that we like and then emphasize and leave all the things about the courts that we don't. <laughs> that, that's their idea of reform. It's bizarro world. It's totalitarian. It's Marxist. And that's why they're urging you to join them in their effort to oppose this, to say no to, to Biden's Supreme Court coup. If you want more information or to add your name uh, to their petition to stand up against this, you can check out Supreme Coup, C-O-U-P, SupremeCoup.com slash Dace. That's SupremeCoup.com slash Dace. Um, this could absolutely help to send a message, especially to spineless Republicans, not to cave on this like you do everything else. SupremeCoup.com slash Dace. Again, that's SupremeCoup.com slash Dace. Um, this is all what we just discussed, by the way, we did a three non-political questions with uh, my daughter, Anna, a couple months ago. And she asked, if you guys go back and change one thing about your lives from the past, what would it be? And I, I struggled to answer, not because there's not many things in my past life I'm not ashamed of, but <clears throat> because they helped to frame the life I have now. God's ways are not our Correct. ways. Yeah, I can't, I can't do the math that God does. Yes. I, I can't take tragedy and turn them for good. I don't know. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sovereign. I'm not the creator. I'm not the manufacturer. Now, that doesn't mean we go out looking for tragedy so that good may come. Todd will, or Paul will address that in the book of mm -hmm. Romans too, okay? But yeah, that's, that's part of the story and the testimony that God has woven within each of us. More in a moment. If you want to make sure that you are getting the fullness of this grilling season, Backyard Butchers is a Christian conservative Texas-based company dedicated to delivering the absolute best deals in the market on high-quality beef. Your box will include all born and raised American beef from ranches, farms, right here in the heartland of America. Um, and you can't beat it. The, the meat's amazing. It's grass-fed, grain-finished. Some of the best burgers I've had this entire summer were the burgers I grilled up from Backyard Butchers. They were incredible. So you can cut out the frustration of the meat aisle. Go to BackyardButchers.com. Save an extra 20% off your entire order when you do by using the code DACE. And if you subscribe, you'll get an additional 10% off plus free shipping at BackyardButchers.com slash DACE. Find out for yourself, for yourself why they've got over a half a million happy customers across the country, hundreds of five-star reviews online, and an American-based customer service team of stay-at-home moms, which means they got this thing on lockdown. And you'll be able to understand them as well. 
All right. Backyardbutchers.com is on a mission to bring American raised, harvested, and affordable meat back to your dinner table. Go to backyardbutchers.com slash dace. Get 20% off your entire order. And when you subscribe, get an additional 10% off and free shipping. Backyardbutchers.com slash dace. All right. Any further thoughts we have on these two verses before we finish up in chapter three of Romans? We good? I think so. All All right. right. I think this this could be a fascinating conversation then. So after explaining that we have no cause to boast, to earn our faith, um, because it was granted to us, a propitiation was made by Christ through his blood, Paul then says this, starting in verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting, it is excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. All right, who wants to tackle this one first? Well, I may as well start off with this one because I think it'll prompt responses from both of you, and it's probably where some of your commentary was going to go. Actually, I'm going to tell you right now, as great of a preacher as he was, Mr. Spurgeon is quiet as kept on these verses. (laughs) So that's one of the reasons why I asked you all, what do you think first? All right, go ahead, Todd. Yes. Uh. Yes, here we go. Uh, On behalf of himself and his missionary collaborators, Paul addresses the question of how a person is initially justified in Christ. For clarity, he couples an affirmation with a denial. Justification, he affirms, takes place by means of faith. Faith is what reaches out to God and accepts the gift of righteousness that is offered in Jesus. Now, contrary to Martin Luther and others... Faith, as he has described it, is not the sole instrument that brings this about, since Paul elsewhere contends that one is justified through the sacrament of baptism, 1 Corinthians 6.11, Titus 3.5-7. Likewise, the apostle defines faith as something that acts in love, Galatians 5.6, and obedience to the gospel, Romans 1.5 and 16.26. Indeed, Paul has a very broad concept of saving faith. It is nothing less than the total response of the human person to God and his loving initiative. It is exercised when we entrust ourselves to God, when we trust in the promises that God makes, when we assent to the truth that God reveals, and when we consent to live as God requires. Now, I don't think this is a a totally new concept. I know it's not a totally new concept. Very early on in our discussions, we talked about, okay, what is faith? What What's in there? Is it just a meditation? Is it just an ascent? Is is uh, the the uh, the uh, church fathers taught that baptism is part of the faith? So I think we're we're getting deeper into those waters now. Is I think what's happening. I agree, and I think now we've moved beyond the achievement of salvation now into the um, the recognition of justification, and that's what we, so we're kind of back to the arguments we were having uh, when we got to when we got in Romans 1 17, right? The, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Right. All right. Aaron, you have any kind thoughts on that or do you want to counter with uh, what Mr. Spurgeon says? I mean, kind of the same story, uh, gets into verse 27 a little bit, then skips over the rest and goes straight to chapter four, uh, which is, he has some good stuff on chapter four. Um, So in uh, verse uh, 27 of chapter 3, here's what Sproul has to say. Since righteousness comes only through faith in Christ Jesus, Paul asks, where is boasting them? Paul answers his question emphatically. Boasting is excluded since our justification is by faith alone, by no merit in us or endeavors of our works. There is no room whatsoever for boasting save in Christ. And then we get into chapter four, which I don't think we want to do yet. But yeah, but kind of quiet is kept on uh, on those uh, ensuing verses. So let's let's deal with this this point first, okay? 
when when Paul is points out here that God is not the God of the Jews only, not the God of is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Okay, what what he is what he's the the case that he's making here again over and over again is there's one standard, there's one system that it's always been based on faith. Okay, that it's always been based on that. What the writer of Hebrews will will reiterate that. Okay, and what we mean about based on faith is that these are acts of faithful obedience. Okay, that that God has demonstrated himself in his greatness to me. He has revealed himself to me first and foremost in the Old Testament as a Jew through my father, Abraham, through Moses and the law, through the prophets, through the Psalms, through the mighty works and the signs and wonders that uh, if even if they didn't happen in my time and era as an Old Testament Jew, the things that were that were learned and passed down and the evidence is that even if I didn't wander that desert for 40 years and I didn't and, and then I didn't see God use the use use my ancestors with my own eyes to to lay waste to the the Canaanite pagans that inhabited the land that we now have okay I'm living in this land I got here somehow right we were no you know we were nomads how did yep. we get here how do we how do we take out seven of the the seven cultures that lived here before us right I mean the the I I these traditions the, the these orthodoxies are passed down to me and even if I didn't see them I, materialistically, the, the, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen, the evidence of events that I did not see with my own eyes, okay? But the fact that we live differently than other people, that our God is more personal than other gods, that our, that our, that our God is more powerful than other gods, I live in the unseen evidence of that, even if they occurred for me later in a time, in, in, in a different period of time of, of Old Testament Israel, that I didn't witness them for myself first and foremost. And so I still go to temple, okay, and I still make the sacrifices, or if I'm in the middle of a disbursement, I still go to synagogue or whatever what other, other accommodations were made. I still practice these these rituals i still engage in this old testament proto version of word and sacrament because the the evidence on faith that these things are true and that god is at work through these things and even in a period of time where i don't see it or understand it that god is still at work through these mechanisms all right and will honor that obedience if it's out of faith i will still live and obey out of faith that word and sacrament does that make sense yes, yes. and that's no different than right now it did not change okay the premise didn't the premise has not changed we could argue whether the methodology has right right and they argued about this they get into this in the book of acts do gentiles now have to carry out the the civil and religious ordinances of of mm -hmm. the, the old testament law or did it, or or does the moral law that's always existed right. is that all that applies now all right and they they came to some that was basically your first conclave if you will in the history of the church and they debated that amongst themselves all right and came to the conclusion that the the the, the gentiles were held to be held under the moral law that has existed throughout time bef long before 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 there was a single levite priest it, god thought it was wrong to murder right okay and so the moral law was to remain in effect the gentiles were to demonstrate their faithful obedience by practicing and living that moral law all right and so it's, it's never not been about faith it's never not been about that the methodology of what that looks like the ritualistic system that existed before this the holy spirit was given democratically small day to every believer okay not just people with individual anointings like prophets of the old testament okay um was that was still you you listen to that prophet because hey this amos guy was this really dirty scrubby shepherd last week now he just showed up here in town and dude knows more, knows more bible than the than the that the priest does i know he didn't i know he didn't take turbo hebrew school so we got it somewhere, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is a sign and wonder of God that He's speaking through this shepherd Amos. I'm going to listen and do what it says. See what I'm saying? It's always been about faith. That premise has never changed. Okay, never changed. Now the method of what that has looked like throughout the course of the of the of, the, of redemptive history um, in the Old and New Testament has been different. Okay, but the premise of it has never been different. It's always been about faith all right abraham was called out of the, was out of ur of the chaldeas he responded in faith he cannot see this god 
And according to some traditions, his father is an idol maker, so he's surrounded by all kinds of foreign gods. He cannot see this God. He cannot touch this God. He cannot hold hands with this God that has called him. He responds to him, him, in him taking initiative with him out of faith and follows him. It's always been about faith. Always. That's never, that, that's, that's something I think we can all agree on is that premise has always been true. Never changed. Yeah, so what is, what is the point of... What is the point of uh, this passage? So verses 27 through 31. I mean, reviewing, this was a church in Rome. If I remember correctly, when we were setting this up, it was still, though, made up of uh, a lot of Jews still. Yes. Still. So mm-hmm. that's, that's his audience. And we know uh, from other cross-references, you know, Paul talks about um, uh, this what he's talking about here is going to be a stumbling block to the Jew, foolishness to the to the Greek. Okay, so he is he is concerned, or he knows he knows that after going through justification by faith, he is going to get accused of antinomianism or being against the law. Mm-hmm. What he's trying to reinforce. I mean, we can live any way we want now that we're saved. Correct. Yes. He's what correct. he's trying to reinforce here. No, is actually is actually the precedence of the law. He's actually trying to reinforce that and also um, also weave in uh, to um, salvate. Let me just read this from a commentary from John MacArthur. He's doing three things here. Providing by this faith, we uphold the law. What is he saying here? He's providing a payment for the penalty of death, fulfilling the law's original purpose, which is what you just got into, Steve, and by giving believers the capacity to obey it. He's not trying to, he's trying to make sure that his Jewish, primarily Jewish audience understands that salvation, what Christ's work on the cross accomplished is actually the fulfillment of the law. He's not trying to do away with it. Hmm. Because he knows, he knows that this audience. And Paul will be charged by this, by his fellow Jews all throughout his ministry. Okay. Yes. And, and by the way, why is there so much focus again on the juxtaposition of Jews and Gentiles in this book in particular? Because remember, go back to our introduction to Romans when we started this back in March. This was the first truly diverse enclave of the church, meaning and diversity as it's diversity is not necessarily ethnic. Uh, the concept of race as we define it today doesn't exist anywhere in the scriptures, anywhere, Old or New Testament, okay? So diversity is not what we mean here. What it means is that Jews and Gentiles worshiping together in a corporate setting in mass had never happened before, okay, um, until this Christian enclave in Rome. And so that's why he is going back and forth between these two camps, because this is the first time really ever that we're going to see Christian, you're going to see uh, Jews and Gentiles worshiping corporately in mass together. All right. Without, without restrictions, like the, there was a court of the Gentiles in the old temple in some places, if you were not a Jew, you could not go. All right. They're going to fully commune together. They're going to practice communion. They're going to baptize. They're going to live in word and sacrament completely together where this where this barrier between the two no longer exists and so when 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 the jewish believer comes with all of those customs and and all that history and legacy and the gentiles like i just got saved last week and i love jesus i don't know what anything else means <laughs> okay <Yeah. laughs> i don't i don't even know i've never even heard the term messiah i don't know i'm, I'm greek and uncircumcised and i like bacon all right so how are these people going to learn to live together because from this time forward there's not going to be a dividing line between jew and gentile there's just going to be one lord one baptism and one faith that's what he exactly. that's why he keeps doing that but you're not describing something that's merely progr- um pragmatic what you're describing it was is as Aaron just said, it was the whole point all along, mm-hmm. fulfilling and redeeming all things. And it speaks in a, a still small voice that is challenging to understand, going all the way back when you think about uh, this this king uh, Melchizedek coming up in a land of uh, blood sacrifices, and he offers bread and wine. Mm-hmm. That. that the, the, again, the truth has come outside of space and time and our categories and our expectations in so many ways going all the way back. The only category that matters has a name and his name is Jesus. Amen. And all the rest are ultimately shattered and you bend your knee to the one true king. Amen. Everything else is a shadow or shattered. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yep. I've never heard. Is that? Did you make that? I up just kind of threw that in. But yeah. Wow. Because yeah. you mentioned like- you mentioned Melchizedek, which is kind of a shadowing, a foreshadowing. Shadow or shattered. Yeah. Wow. You should 
write a book about that. By the way, if you want to fast, if you want to, if those of you that want to research fascinating topics in the Bible, because I get asked, I get, got asked another one last week about Nephilim. Some of that stuff is interesting, but if you really want to research something unique that really gets you to the heart of the Bible, research Melchizedek, all right? Both old and new. That That is, that is one of those dangling participles out there that will lead you into, into I think, some real more appreciation for your faith. Um, and this is a great way, by the way, to segue to our friends over at Voice of Judah. Uh, we are proud to be supporting them. They're a messianic ministry focused on the, in the heartland of Israel, bringing the heart of God, the gospel, back to the place that, uh, that brought it to the rest of the world. All right, taking the gospel back to uh, the people that God originally gave it to us from. All right. And that's what they try to do there at Voice of Judah. They aim to inspire evangelism, discipleship, church planting right there in the nation of Israel. They do a lot of this as well with all kinds of humanitarian outreach to support the Jewish people. So if you want to take advantage, the harvest is plenty there, man, maybe more than it ever has been right now. Okay, Uh, but the workers are few, as the Lord said. All right. You can visit their website, vojisrael.org slash Steve. That's VOJ for Voice of Judah, vojisrael.org slash Steve. You can learn more about their inspiring work to bless Israel right there at vojisrael.org slash Steve. Any final thoughts here in the last 30 seconds? I'm serious. I can't believe you just thought that up on the fly. I thought you'd like that's some brilliant, brilliant Protestant hermeneutic. That I mean, that's a homily. Sh- Shadow probably, or shatter? I, Do you know how much? I've probably listened and read so many other people's Bible teaching that I just plagiarized somebody when I said that, and I can't even remember who it was, so my bad. Well, no, that's... I'm ins- I found it inspiring. I, like I, the whole coupon uh, analogy I gave you? I didn't make that up. I heard that like 10 years ago. I'm a really good plagiarist of great Bible t-shirts. I just, I can't ever, can't always remember where I heard stuff for the first time. All right. We are going to stick around and do overtime for over, for our subscribers for the rest of you. You'll get a great evergreen tomorrow with John Cooper of Skillet. Until then, Romans 828.